This is a production of Cornell University. Hello, I'm Michelle Moody Adams, Professor of Philosophy and Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education at Cornell University. I'm delighted to welcome you to this Cyber Tower Forum for the 2008 Cornell New Student Reading Project. We're here to discuss Gary Wills' Pulitzer Prize winning book, Lincoln at Gettysburg, The Words That Remade America chosen for this year's incoming class. Wills argues that Lincoln's 272-word address at Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, the site of the 1863 battle that was the turning point of the Civil War, has become a symbol of national purpose, pride, and ideals. Lincoln at Gettysburg thus invites readers to reflect on the ideals that should shape America's national purpose. But in addition, Lincoln at Gettysburg encourages us to consider the political implications of race, the nature of leadership, the challenge of commemorating the sacrifices of those who fight in a contested war, the bearing of the past upon the present, and the dynamics of politics. Wills' book is a compelling work of history to be sure, but it is also a rich and illuminating analysis of the power of effective communication and of well-crafted political rhetoric. The power of words, Wills argues, has rarely been given a more compelling demonstration than in the Gettysburg Address. Wills' Lincoln at Gettysburg is thus an ideal choice for the new student reading project. This year, the reading project will connect the Cornell community to the commemoration in February 2009 of the 200th anniversary of Lincoln's birth. This is fitting since Cornell has many special connections to Lincoln's legacy. Cornell's founding in 1865 was an outcome of Lincoln's signing of the 1862 Morrill Act, creating the first land-grant institutions of higher education. In addition, the Cornell University Library has one of the five known copies of the Gettysburg Address in Lincoln's handwriting. During new student orientation, the library will mount a special exhibition including what is called the Bancroft copy of the Gettysburg Address. Now, this will be the eighth year of Cornell's new student reading project. It was designed to provide a common intellectual experience for new and transfer students and for the Cornell community through campus-wide events and group discussions with students, faculty, and staff. Incoming students receive copies of the selected book to read over the summer and Cornell's Reading Project website provides background and enrichment for readers as they make their way through the text. On the Sunday of New Student Orientation in late August, a panel of Cornell faculty members will discuss the book and invite student questions in preparation for the next day's meetings of more than 220 small discussion groups. Members of the Ithaca community, high school students across the state, and Cornell alumni also take part in reading and discussion groups of their own. And during the academic year, lectures, panel discussions, films, and other events will relate to the reading project to encourage discussion of the issues raised by Lincoln at Gettysburg. Now, Will's discussions of the dynamics of politics should prove especially provocative this year in the context of the fall 08 national election. Wills offers no simplistic analyses and no easy answers. Instead, he asks the reader to reflect on the complexities of political life and political agency and to resist the tendency to think in terms of simple dichotomies or absolutes divorced from the contingencies of political life. Joining me in today's discussion of Lincoln at Gettysburg are three distinguished Cornell faculty members, Hunter Rawlings, served as president of Cornell from 1995 to 2003 and again in 2005 to 6. He is now president emeritus and professor of classics and history at Cornell. He teaches courses in Greek and Latin language and literature and in ancient history and has recently developed a seminar on the classical influences upon American constitutional history. His research interests focus on Greek and Roman historians and upon the making of the U.S. Constitution. Ed Baptist is an associate professor in the Department of History at Cornell. His specialty 
is the history of slavery, the American South, and the 19th century U.S. He grew up in Durham, North Carolina, and was educated in the public schools there and at Georgetown University. He received his Ph.D. from the University of Pennsylvania. He's currently writing a book about the expansion of slavery in the United States from 1787 to 1865. Tad Brennan is a professor of Cornell's Sage School of Philosophy, specializing in ancient Greek and Roman philosophy. Tad has a PhD in classics from Princeton University and has taught at King's College London, Yale, and Northwestern University. He's published on Plato, Aristotle, the Stoics, and other classical philosophers, and is interested in the influence of the classics on American political thought. Welcome to you all, and thank you for joining me to discuss Lincoln and Gettysburg. One interesting place to start might be with looking a little bit at that myth, common myth, that uh, the Gettysburg Address was written hastily on the, on the back of an envelope. I think Wills's book helps give us an inroad into sort of challenging that myth. I don't know if, Ed, if you have any thoughts about uh, where that myth takes us. Well, I think that, uh, as, as Wills makes clear, uh, there are several different versions of this and several different uh, accounts of how it was written, but most likely it was written over a longer period of time than just, let's say, the train ride up to Gettysburg, because Lincoln's habit of composition was to take a long time to work on something very slowly, to try out multiple versions on multiple readers or multiple listeners. So it's, it seems unlikely, uh, given all the different accounts of all the different people who saw him writing at one point, or another that just one of those is right. He was probably working on on the Gettysburg Address at all of those different points in front of all of those different people over a period of a couple of weeks. Wonderful. And it is amazing to think that Lincoln had, what, maybe 18 months total of formal schooling, and he's just a master of the English language, and clearly that's one of the things that emerges from the book. Um, might we start by talking a little bit about the origins of the Civil War and uh, some of the political and constitutional um, conflicts that led us to November 19, 1863? Well, if, if you look at the uh, uh, citizenship test that most people have to take when they come to the U.S. and they want to become citizens, the question that asks you what were the origins of the U.S. Civil War is probably the only one that has two officially correct answers. Oh. <laughs> uh, and you can answer either <laughs> slavery or debates over states' rights. And this has to do with the way in which people have been arguing about the origins of the Civil War ever since it happened. Right. Different people say different things. But in fact, I would argue, if you look at the actual history of the period from the Constitution up to the Civil War, the one constant thing, uh, the one constant phenomenon that is creating the conflicts that will ultimately divide the North and the South uh, uh, along um, uh, a set of issues that are so heated and so contentious that they will in fact go to war over them is the question of the expansion of slavery. And that brings up both the issue of slavery and the issue uh, of what are uh, the rights of the different states to determine how uh, society will be structured within those states. So if you look at uh, things like the Missouri Compromise uh, in 1820, uh, if you look at the, uh, the questions which emerge following the, the conquest of large sections of territory from Mexico, if you look at the Compromise of 1850, the Kansas-Nebraska issue of 1854, and the Dred Scott case of 1857, in all of these cases, what's at issue is whether or not slavery is going to continue to expand. Okay. My, my brother recently asked me whether there had ever been states' rights advocates who were not adopting this as a cloak for racism of one sort or another. And I was able to point him to one of the anti-federalist authors, uh, Brutus, writing in New York, who makes a very interesting and principled case for states' rights without any interest in defending slavery. Can you come up with anyone after that date? <laughs> <laughs> so that would have been the late 1780s? That's right. So <laughs> at the time of the ratification debates about the Constitution, so right, roughly 17, yeah, 87 or so. Well, I, I'm sure you could find some people who at various points in times borrowed this argument. Uh, nevertheless, the most important public expositions and uses of this argument were consistently those who were arguing for the defense of slavery and for the right, uh, not just of the states that already exist, 
to main, maintain slavery within their bounds, you know, Virginia, South Carolina, and so on. But those who are arguing uh, that as citizens they have the right to move west with their slaves and establish ultimately new slave societies. And so that's a, also a question that um, comes to not just um, uh, involve the rights uh, of, of states to determine what happens within their own boundaries, mm -hmm. but in the hands of someone like John C. Calhoun, the South Carolina politician, it becomes a, an argument that you can't, in fact, prohibit slavery anywhere mm. because what's involved then is the property rights of American citizens who, for Calhoun, are pretty much all white, uh, to, to carry their property, enslaved African Americans, mm. wherever they want. And in fact, Lincoln makes great use of this, this sort of logical end uh, of the argument that Calhoun is advancing to say, look, fellow Northerners, if we do not stop the expansion of slavery uh, to Kansas or to uh, what is today Arizona or any of these Western territories, that ultimately we're going to have slavery in Massachusetts and New Hampshire mm -hmm. and New York and so on and so forth. Because that's the logical end of this argument that people are property, that certain people are property, and that citizens cannot be denied the right to transport property wherever they want within the, the bounds of the U.S. Well, I suppose Calhoun's stance had been ratified and endorsed by the Supreme Court uh, in, in the Dred Scott decision then. That's correct. Uh, Which Lincoln says something about in an important uh, speech. What, what was Lincoln's stand on the Dred Scott? Well, the Dred Scott case uh, in 1857 um, essentially argues that Congress does not have the right to prohibit uh, American citizens from bringing uh, their slaves into territories. And of course, if you can't block slavery from expanding into territories, territories ultimately become states. So you have more slave states added to the Union. And that's that's the import of the, uh, the Dred Scott decision. Lincoln has two positions uh, on the Dred Scott case. One is that this is law. It's been settled. Law, of course, can be changed. Uh, we can bring another case forward. We can change the composition of the Supreme Court over time. We can make arguments against it and so on and so forth. But we need to obey it while it's law. We don't need to be running around talking about how we're not going to obey the law. We'll leave that for the secessionists. But on the other hand, uh, he argues that this is, in fact, uh, a poorly made law, which is illogical and which contradicts the basic tenets of, of what, for him, makes America uh, a special place, what makes America worth fighting for, what makes union worth fighting for. And that is the principle uh, that uh, is enunciated in the Declaration of Independence uh, for Lincoln, at least in Lincoln's reading, which is that all men are endowed by the Creator with certain inalienable rights. Uh, the Dred Scott decision, um, by contrast, insisted that African Americans cannot be citizens and that they do not have rights in the language of the decision which white people are bound to respect. And, and this, I take it, in, in Lincoln's mind, destabilized what had been an uncomfortable but at least somewhat stable compromise that there should be free and slave states neither encroaching on the other, that, that the extent of slavery should not expand beyond roughly what it had been at the time of the Constitution. That, that I take it, Lincoln's view was that that was bad enough, but we could live with it provided that slavery was on its way to eventual extinction, pro right. provided that we could... Right feel confident that it was on its way out, then we would remain within the bounds of the constitutional compromise. Dred Scott destabilized that by removing the last check to its expansion throughout the Union and turning the entire country into a series of slave states. Right. And, and uh, as, as the, the, the case itself is actually about territories, but Lincoln says, What's next is the attempt to bring slavery into the states. And in fact, there was a case that was proceeding through the federal courts by 1860, New York versus Lemon, in which uh, Southerners uh, were in fact arguing precisely that, mm -hmm. that they should be able to bring slaves into the state of New York, for instance, and have their rights to claim that property and to control that property, property as they, they see enslaved African Americans, and that the federal government, if necessary, should enforce that right, even if the state of New York, which has outlawed slavery by 1860, is not willing to do that. I think you're exactly right, Tad. Lincoln sees this as moving backwards, mm. as moving backwards towards the realization of the ideals that, or at least the movement further on the, the line towards the realization of the ideals that are enunciated in the Declaration of Independence. 
I think what's striking about Lincoln throughout this is that he insists that the country was founded on the basis of a proposition. Right. And he says that so clearly and so powerfully, and it separates, in a sense, this country from other countries that were not so founded. Awesome. And the idea that we were founded on the basis of a proposition is, it seems to me, a kind of announcement um, that this is a very serious purpose and that it's the bedrock of what the country stands for. He doesn't seem to want any kind of compromise on that point at all. I think, uh, no compromise on, on the centrality of that proposition. Although he's willing to compromise on its implementation. On, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that is, he, he rejects the, the radical abolitionist call for immediate emancipation that would actually run contrary to constitutional provisions. He mm -hmm. does think that the maintenance of the constitutional forms, uh, and as you were pointing in obedience to the law, uh, actually is a more important priority than the immediate emancipation, uh, emancipation mm -hmm. of uh, slaves. Mm -hmm. Although he wasn't always recognized to have that position, the speech before the Cooper Union mm. sort of involves him having to really defend himself against certain suspicions that secretly he's really supporting the more radical abolitionist mm -hmm. view. So, but, but the public position certainly was this um, the sense that he was willing to allow the, the transition from slavery to a non-slave right. world uh, to take place more slowly. So. Yeah, that's the position that uh, many Northern Republicans come to understand him as holding when they, when they vote for him mm -hmm. in 1860. And, and he's following this middle road between the radical abolitionists and those who, like Northern Democrats, would allow slavery, in fact, to expand if that was what was necessary to keep the continued... Uh, stability of the political regime. Now, Southern whites, uh, particularly those who were adamantly pro-slavery, which was most of the politicians in the South by, by 1860, uh, were having none of this. They did not buy it. They felt that he was in some ways more dangerous than radical abolitionists mm. because he could put together a majority of Northern voters, and in fact, that's what he did. He, in fact, got a majority in the Electoral College behind his position. But uh, the, the ultimate outcome of that would be the blocking of any further expansion for slavery. And the expansion of slavery both as an economic institution, as a political force, in other words, the creation of more states that would have more pro-slavery senators and more pro-slavery representatives yeah. in Congress That's and so right. on. Mm -hmm. this, this was absolutely necessary to maintain slavery mm -hmm. and to maintain their, their way of life, their, their mode of, of making uh, money. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, the, the world as they understood it, they could not understand what their society would look like without slavery. They couldn't accept that future. Mm. So what precipitates the crisis that leads to the Civil War? You know, Lincoln's, what, Lincoln's <laughs> election. Lincoln's election and, yeah. and how, we, wh how does uh, secession take place? What, what are the sort of first pieces of that, that process? Well, the first piece is that uh, South Carolina, which had traditionally been the most radical of the, the pro-slavery uh, regimes in the southern states, uh, immediately after Lincoln's election, puts into place a plan which state politicians had already sort of had in, in, in their little file folder, if you will, ready to go. And, and that's they, they, uh, it goes like this. They call a, a special convention, uh, supposedly uh, with composed representatives who are directly um, representative of the, of the people. In other words, this is not part of the regu regular legislative process. This is a, a special thing. It's sort of like a constitutional convention, except, if you will, it's a unwinding or unraveling the Constitution convention. Okay. And at this, they uh, declare their opposition to um, remaining in the Union anymore. They secede, as, as they claim, right. from the Union. And after that, a series of other Deep South states go out of the Union, one after the other. Uh, until I believe seven of them have, have gone by the end of January. Right. I hadn't known that, that the, of, of the nature of the special convention. That, that, that does explain to me, or at least um, I wonder if that's connected with uh, Article 6 of the Constitution where members of the state legislature and all executive members of the states, so the governor of South Carolina, every member of the, gov of the South Carolina legislature had to swear an oath of allegiance to the federal Constitution. So ex officio, in, insofar as I'm a South Carolina legislature, I have to swear to preserve, protect, and defend the American Constitution. On the other hand, once I set aside my legislatorial hat and become a private citizen, 
then it's perfectly open to me. They, they might have thought, right, this, <laughs> this might be the rationale for doing this as a special convention, not as a South Carolina legislature. Once I set that rule aside, now I'm really a private citizen, and I'm not bound by that, that constitutional oath to uphold the federal constitution. Well, I think the other piece of it is that this is exactly how the Constitution was ratified between 1787 and 1789, not by the sitting state legislatures, uh -huh. but by special conventions, because right. a, a representative body cannot make, uh, according to this particular constitutional theory that they were mm -hmm. following, cannot make uh, the overarching framework of rules for themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, they can make their day-to-day -day rules. Right. What will the sergeant at arms do? That sort of thing. But the ultimate rules, which are going to govern them, have to be made by some other body, and and preferably by something that is directly representative of the people. So that's mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. what I mean by a sort of unraveling by a, a mm -hmm. putting putting everything in reverse mm -hmm. and backing up through the process again mm -hmm. that had brought them into the union by going through the inverse of that. They hope to sort of justify their going out of the union. Right. And the war came. And the war right. came. Yeah. And some of the main battles that lead, that take place prior to Gettysburg being, you know, we've described it as the turning point in the war. Can you name a couple of other battles before uh, 1863 that seemed uh, really pivotal in the course of the war and that sort of will help explain why Gettysburg has this place in history for us? Uh, there, there are a couple of them, and, and we were we were talking earlier, some of us, about the various battlefield sites that we visited. Right, um, so we should uh, all chime in here. But right. uh, <laughs> probably the the first important one is First Bull Run, when it becomes obvious that the South is not going to be defeated very quickly, right. and that Lincoln's going to have to raise a much bigger army than he had thought, mm -hmm. and that uh, the nature of the endeavor that the, gov that the government is going to have to um, carry out is going to be much more serious than, than many who had said we'll be in Richmond in two weeks right. uh, had ever um, been able to conceive of. Antietam is another important battle that we were speaking in fact about earlier, right. the, one of the right. largest or maybe the largest loss of American life in a single day of battle, That's mm -hmm. 26,000 people, mm -hmm. a yeah. battle after which it was thought the North might have been able to win the war had certain uh, events taken place afterwards. They did not take place. Generals lost their nerve, General <laughs> McClellan in particular. But Lincoln seized upon it nonetheless um, because he needed a victory very badly and okay. he was getting ready, um, as you know, to put forward his Emancipation Proclamation, but he needed to wait for some kind of signal event. And he took Antietam as such a victory, even though it was a very qualified victory, um, as Ed was saying earlier. So Antietam has a, a certain symbolic value, even if it was a bloody stalemate. Right. Right. Sorry, so this is autumn 62? Mm -hmm. right. Right. September. Okay. September. September 62. 62. Right. 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 So, so the preparatory Emancipation Proclamation has already been issued or not? It's issued after Antietam. I see. Even, even the initial one saying, look, I'm going to do this. I'm serious about this. You've got <laughs> one last step to come back into right. the Union. Yeah. Okay, that's, in, that's that's after Antietam, and then and then he actually pulls the trigger in what January first or December? January first, eighteen sixty three. Right. Mm -hmm. But okay. then, interestingly, following that, you don't have a succession of uh, northern victories. In fact, probably Lee's greatest victory, the Battle of Chancellorsville, mm -hmm. follows that, um, precedes Gettysburg, and mm -hmm. in fact leads Lee to believe that he can now invade the North, and that's what leads eventually to the campaign at. Gettysburg. So it's still a, a very difficult uh, war, <laughs> and uh, not a one-sided war, right. by the time the battle at Gettysburg is joined in July of 63. Right. Well, that is something we'd, we'd see on a map, right? Bull Run, Antietam, Chancellorsville, they're all in Virginia. They're all south of the Mason-Dixon line. Right. They're mm -hmm. all taking place on, as it were, southern soil. Uh, mm -hmm. Although, you know, Wills points out that Lincoln always insists, no, it's our national mm -hmm. right. soil. Mm -hmm. Right. Gettysburg is up north. Right. Yeah. Gettysburg uh, is in Pennsylvania, uh, mm -hmm. the high watermark of the Confederacy, as it's sometimes right. called. Uh, mm -hmm. So an actual counter-invasion by the, the South. Uh, well, Antietam is an effort to make one of those invasions, and Lee is uh -huh. sort of replaying the same strategy the next year, only he goes much further. further he actually mm -hmm. invades a non-slave-owning state with Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thought was what to come, so to come through Pennsylvania and, and then to swing towards the ocean, towards the coast, or how is that going to work? I wonder what his next, had that succeeded, I wonder what his next objective was to be, I don't know offhand. Well, 
Ed's the expert, but I think just briefly, um, it, it seems Lee was not really planning a long-term invasion, mm -hmm. but rather trying to win a, a major victory or two right. and see if right. he couldn't bring the, the North to end the war. To the mm -hmm. table, yeah. Right. Based on mm -hmm. a couple of solid victories, uh, rather than a long-term invasion that was going to result in years of, uh, of fighting. Mm. Well, there had been plans to capture Washington, D.C. I mean, yeah. I take it uh, earlier, at yeah. any rate, that is, there was some thought that the South would just m march up and occupy the federal government, and, and mm -hmm. that would have very quickly brought the North to terms. Yeah. Uh, so, not much came of those efforts. Right. 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 So let's, for a moment, move a bit beyond the battle itself, so we won't have time to necessarily detail every each of the three days. Move it forward to November 19th, 1863, and Everett and Lincoln have arrived at the um, cemetery, the, the, the battlefield to commemorate the, as a national cemetery. And we get these two very different speeches. We get the two-hour mm -hmm. uh, oration that harkens back to many of the classical Greek traditions of oratory. And then we get 272 words that take about, what, two minutes in Lincoln's uh, yep. vocal habits to deliver. And this is really quite an extraordinary contrast. And then Lincoln's speech, according to Wills, is in its own way internally quite extraordinary. What do we make of the what the audience would have expected? Hunter, well, it's a wonderful contrast, as you say, and people never tire of pointing out that the two-hour oration uh, has been more or less forgotten by history, <laughs> and the two-minute uh, preparatory remarks it has become probably the best-known speech in American history, and for good reason. Um, but at the time, I think the reaction was really quite different, and uh, Wills brings that out pretty well in his book. Edward Everett, uh, professor, former president at Harvard, legislator, major public figure, was regarded as the finest orator of the day, and that was saying something at that time because there were lots of splendid orators. Yeah. He was classically trained. He spoke beautifully, very loudly. He prepared exceedingly well. He gave a two-hour talk. Mm -hmm. And the audience, from everything we can tell, liked it quite a lot. Right. They were expecting a long talk. It didn't shock them as being overly long. This is exactly what you did on such occasions at cemeteries in particular in the 19th century. And Wills spends a lot of time bringing that out as part of the cult of the dead right. um, in the 19th century and part of the cult of founding cemeteries in rural areas. Um, Lincoln's talk was regarded as something that presidents do. Mm -hmm. And um, I know about such talks, having given quite a large number <laughs> in my sure. time. Sure. Um, you're asked to come and sort of bless an occasion. Right. But please don't speak very long, <laughs> is, is the uh, underlying uh, demand. And um, Lincoln, of course, sees the moment by compressing, as he was just so remarkably able to do, um, a lot of American thought and a lot of American uh, ideals into a, a very short space. And I must say, uh, Lincoln was not devoid of the use of classical terms, right. classical rhetoric, um, and Wills brings out quite clearly how well he was able to bring that in as well as the biblical. Um, so it's a remarkable contrast, but it's one that's a little different, I think, from the way it's often taken to be. Yes. I must say, I really enjoyed uh, Everett's speech. I'm very glad that, that, that Wills... <laughs> you read the whole it. thing. Yeah, no, I, mean, <laughs> I, 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 would, I would urge yes, our students to, to read, read the whole thing. Excellent. <laughs> to read the whole darn thing, yeah. Excellent. No, it's, it's actually a very good speech. Yes. I, I'm not sure that I would be able to sit through it in delivery. Uh, two hours is a long time, right. but it reads quite quickly. And you could sort of read it in some fraction of that. And it's a very good speech. It's quite interesting. It's, it's uh, dramatic, vivid. It gives you a, a narrative recap of the day's events, and also does tackle some of the arguments for uh, secession. Uh, he, mm -hmm. he actually does take the time to say, now the secessionists claim that they have the following rationale for what they're doing, and I have the following counter-arguments against it. I think this is, you know, they don't have the right to secede and so on. So it covers quite a, quite a lot of territory. It's I think very good Ted's comments are helpful in um, enabling us to see what the real contrast is between the two speeches. To me, it's not really so much one of length or classical inspiration, but rather um, Everett mentions a lot of details in his speech. Mm -hmm. He talks about the battle itself. He goes into some length on the strategies. Lincoln rises above the particular. Right. He is mm -hmm. simply not concerned with the particular. His speech comes up here 
to a level of almost abstraction right. and principle and proposition as opposed to individual description. And this is what gives Lincoln's rhetoric such remarkable power, is its ability to generalize and to idealize mm -hmm. in a highly compressed form. And I think one of the interesting things you're asking students to do this year is to write up something about an important policy or issue in 272 words. Good luck. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a very yeah. difficult task. I mean, so none experience. of us knows none how us to do, do this. Right. Yeah. But, right. but Abraham Lincoln could do it. Yeah. Only by rising to an altogether different plane, I think. Absolutely. Well, there's some, there's some dangers that you encounter when you become abstract. Mm -hmm. uh, there are dangers uh, in terms of the difficulty in connecting with your audience. How do you connect with your audience mm. if you cannot reach into them and talk about something particular? that you and they share. Mm -hmm. And it might be interesting to, to think about how it is that Lincoln manages to be so abstract and yet so inspirational mm -hmm. at the same time. Let me also explain why, why our appreciation of the speech is so enriched by Wills' presentation of all the surrounding context. Uh, because if you, if you simply didn't know what was being compressed, then it would be rather hard to read it out of the speech again. It would be perhaps impossible to see what this is a distillation of, whereas the more you know, the more you have to stand in awe of his ability to pack it all in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wills uses interesting phrases like, an intel like a sleight of hand, mm -hmm. an, even an intellectual pickpocket who mm -hmm. kind of takes this one thing that they come in with, one idea about what America really is about, and sends them off from the battlefield with another vision, or at least attempts to do that. And I think it's really quite, quite interesting to see. Now, Maybe we could talk a bit, in fact, about the content of the speech and some of the po potentially sure. provocative things well, that I Will think the, says. I think the point you just raised, Michelle, is a good place to start because Will's claim that he picked the pocket of the American people right. has become somewhat controversial. Absolutely. Not everyone agrees that he did that. Right. Um, his point is that he is, in, in effect, rewriting the Constitution right. for the country on the basis of the Declaration of Independence. Right. And I think Wills shows nicely how the Chicago papers, for example, mm -hmm. pointed that out immediately the next day. Absolutely. What is Mr. Lincoln doing? Yeah. This is completely inappropriate. It's wrong. And it's anti-constitutional. Mm -hmm. But what Lincoln seems to me is doing in the way that Ed is suggesting um, is to breathe into the Constitution the, the values of the Declaration. And uh, some feel that it, it perhaps goes too far to claim, as Wills does, that that's a sleight of hand. Right. Um, but that's Wills' argument, and, and I think it stands up fairly well. I'd, yes. I'd be interested to know if, if you all disagree or, yeah. or think that's perhaps a little exaggerated. Well, you know, there are a number of issues that, that get, one can raise in thinking about Wills' argument. I mean, even if you accepted the idea that he made this really masterful effort to kind of reread the Constitution in some way and give you the Declaration as the founding document rather than the Constitution, some critics have read the book and wondered whether um, Wills is attributing too much power to Lincoln, that maybe he's just articulating something that was kind of in the air, maybe through some of the abolitionist arguments or the arguments of uh, freed slaves writing slave narratives. Or, or you, we talked earlier about Harriet Beecher Stowe and uh, Uncle right. Tom's Cabin, that right. you know, it may be that implicit in that sort of picture of what was wrong with slavery was an appeal to the Declaration. I would say nonetheless that even if Lincoln is articulating something that's already there, it's done so masterfully mm -hmm. And it's, it's not just that it's done with so few words, but that it's done without actually saying, I'm doing something that you need to be attentive to. I'm forcing you to see the founding ideals of America in a way somewhat different from what some of our contemporaries think it is. Mm -hmm. So he, even if he's not the first person to say it, he says it with mm -hmm. such mm -hmm. eloquence and mm -hmm. such elegance, I'll even say. And he mm -hmm. makes it the rationale for the struggle and sacrifice that they're faced with. Absolutely. Uh, that this is, in some sense, the, the point um, the, the, that we are uh, fighting uh, this war, uh, that a certain kind of governmental structure shall not perish from the earth. It has not merely national, but international, uh, eternal uh, significance for, as he says elsewhere, the whole family of man, whether this form of government can be uh, practiced. Um, that 
seems to me in some sense a, a stronger uh, rationale for the sacrifice and struggle we're undertaking because in a way the the constitution although it does in one way enshrine certain values in other ways is is much more of a as it were, sort of bureaucratic or administrative document uh, only in only uh, in the preamble does it express grand values. Mm -hmm. uh, the rest is rather you know, sort of uh, technical. Uh, really, a lot of it is um, you know what you might have in a in a computer operating system. Uh, how should these parts interact with each other? Um, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so to find the point of all this, why did these people die? Why did Lincoln himself? I just ran into this the other day. Have to write a letter to a mother saying the War Office has shown me evidence that you've lost five of your sons in order. And I simply want you to know why we're doing this, um, that we appreciate your sacrifice and the sacrifices you've made. Um, it would be hard to sacrifice for anything less important than uh, the fate of free government and the fate of equality for human beings all over the earth for all time. <laughs> Well, I mean, think about this, um, to add to Ted's point, Lincoln manages to do this in a speech in which he never mentions the word slavery. Absolutely. Now, to me, this is just remarkable to take on an issue like this in such a powerful way and never even mention the term slavery or the term slave. Yes. And yet everyone knows what this speech is about. Absolutely. We know exactly the point of this speech, and he avoids the word altogether. It's it's just astonishing. Did he think it was too charged? Do you think, Hunter, that it, uh, that it would distract people from the higher sort of principles that they ought to be? I, I don't about? know about that, but I just think he's on such a high plane mm -hmm. that he can he can pull this off. Right. I guess I, I'm inclined to think that he just doesn't think that there are two separable issues here. Hmm. Uh, that is th the point of fighting for government by the people is to resist tyranny, which has held sway over history for as long as history has been written. Right. Only the United States, exceptional in the world, has a system in which individuals are free and equal. And the wrongness of slavery simply is the wrongness of tyranny applied to a specific case. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I, th I, I think that's the, the reason, not only why he doesn't have to mention slavery, but why, in some sense, he can have felt that it was more important to keep the Union together than to free the slaves. Mm -hmm. It's not that he thought slavery was less bad than we think it is. It's that he thought the badness of slavery is exactly the badness of tyrannical government everywhere. Right. Mm. And this policy alone, the policy of keeping the Union together and vindicating government uh, by self-rule, is the only way to attack tyranny in all its forms, of which slavery is a vivid one, but not the only one. Yeah. So he, just, sorry. Well, I was just going to say that uh, he, he says repeatedly, and he will repeat this in the second inaugural, uh, that uh, the essence of slavery is you make the bread and I eat it. <laughs> yep. You make it with your sweat and I eat it in comfort. And, and this, this is, is a... in fact tyranny. And this mm -hmm. is uh, for too much of human history, this has been the condition of much of humanity. And it's uh, the promise of the United States is the promise of breaking out of that kind of tyranny. Mm -hmm. But as long as we have this massive contradiction, and in fact a growing mm -hmm. contradiction mm -hmm. by 1860, uh, then, then we stand to, uh, to fail uh, in establishing this proposition that, that Hunter was talking about that was the essence of, of the claim to nationhood that the United States had made. But I, but I do want to say that, that Lincoln has, in, so, in some ways he doesn't have to spell all that out mm -hmm. in November 1863 because he's been doing that since 1854 okay. when he mm -hmm. re-enters politics after a sort of hiatus. He'd been a congressman very briefly uh, in the 1840s, uh, had gone out of politics to a large extent except sort of as a behind the scenes uh, organizer. And in 1854, when uh, his local senator, Stephen Douglas, supports the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which expands the, the territory of slavery, he jumps back in. Mm -hmm. And this is his issue, uh, that in fact, slavery should not be allowed to expand because it is uh, an explicit undermining of the promise of America. It mm -hmm. is a contradiction to everything. So he's been making the case, mm -hmm. and he's been making it in all sorts of ways. Yeah. And continually, mm -hmm. as his law partner, William Herndon, says, mm -hmm. he gets to the nub of the issue at hand <laughs> better than anyone else. Yeah. And he does it with abstraction, yeah. or he does it yeah. with the examples, folksy examples that, 
that can do that sort of particular work in certain ways. You know, he talks about slavery as a, uh, a snake that's in the bed with your sleeping children. Yes. Oh. Will you find out that there's a snake in the bed? Do you jump in there? Yeah. No, because you don't know when, if perhaps in the tussle that follows, your children might get bitten. Or on kill. the other hand, he talks mm -hmm. about slavery as a cancer that's growing in a man's arm. Mm -hmm. Well, he can't cut it out right away because it's wrapped around these arteries. But what is he going to do about it? He has to do something about it well, at some don't point. Want it spread. Right. So he's been building this argument yep. over that's time. Right. And this that's allows right. him to be abstract uh, in that very powerful way that, that Hunter brought up. One of the great devices I think he uses in the Gettysburg Address to do this, and again, come back to the rhetoric of the speech, is the birth, death, rebirth. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that's a very vivid, powerful way that is partly biblical mm -hmm. and partly classical, pagan that is, as Wills brings out very effectively in his book, um, it's a way of saying the only way you can solve this terrible problem is through what sounds like, frankly, a, a terrible method, namely death. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what he finds in these deaths, and he refers to those in such a tangible way, these men, these deaths, um, that is what gives us the devotion then to go and make this enormous change which the country absolutely requires. This new birth of freedom. Yes, right. but right. Lincoln never finds easy answers to difficult questions, and it's the thing I've always admired so much about him. The answers are always terribly difficult. They are. Horribly painful. And what he's saying, it seems to me, in the Gettysburg Address is, this is a really painful thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's only through this level of pain that we can get what we absolutely have to get. And so all of these verbs in particular of, of creation in the beginning of the speech um, and uh, leading to then the death on the battlefield and then the rebirth of the nation seems to me make this point terribly, terribly well. It's a wonderful point. I'd, I'd like to propose that, there's a, that, that you could divide the, the address into two big elements. And, and the one element would be this abstract argument that he's offering about the eternal significance of our making good this experiment in self-rule. We're, we're testing a proposition, and if we don't get it right, no one can get it right. Uh, this is an obligation we have to the whole human family to, to do this right, and that's why it's worth struggling as we're struggling. Combine that argument, that particular content, with what in other ways is in to, to an extent, a fairly formulaic instance of the funereal oration. Mm. Uh, Will spends you know, a fair bit of time talking about the Thucydidean uh, background for this, and it's really quite delightful how Will puts these two in parallel. Here's Thucydides, mm -hmm. here's Lincoln, here are the immense numbers of, of parallels, and yet the content is something very different. Thucydides is defending an imperialistic, slave-owning, deeply inegalitarian state. <laughs> Lincoln is not. Lincoln's putting new wine in these old bottles, if you like. Mm -hmm. But there's, as it were, the rhetorical frame that was to some extent ready-made for him. And I wonder if that made his job somewhat easier as well. <laughs> that it's almost reached me down. You could uh, Off the shelf, you could buy a, the structure <laughs> of, a, of a funeral oration from Thucydides. Right. And then pack into it this argument that, that as Ed has been saying, he's been making for quite a while mm -hmm. that Tyranny and slavery are one, that self-rule is the only opposition to both of them, mm -hmm. and that the logical self-rule means we must eliminate slavery. Uh, so those two elements, the, the, the Thucydidean rhetoric with the new egalitarian argument. Yeah. I think there's something in that. On the other hand, it seems to me what Lincoln does is so different um, that you have to give him credit for something quite original here. I mean, the Gettysburg Address is, what, probably 10% as long as the Thucydidean funeral right. oration. Mm. Edward Everett used the Thucydidean yes. epitaphias as well to good effect in his speech, but he follows that sort of full style of rhetoric, whereas Lincoln, again, has compressed so severely. Um, so while you may find some of the same elements, and Wills, I agree, does a good job of mm. finding those parallels, Lincoln has done something here quite different, I think, yeah. from the Periclean funeral oration. In, oh, yeah. in Chapter 5, I think Wills is really trying to make the case for that. After having right. traced some of the mm. historical traditions in the speech, it's Chapter 5 where we discover this is a modern 
political speech. It doesn't really uh -huh. simply reproduce uh -huh. traditions from the past. Right, mm -hmm. revolution mm -hmm. in, in language. In, that absolutely, traces, right? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Everett seems to me is is the real heir to the the Greek tradition, right. um, whereas Lincoln is is founding something new, right. um, and it's something that. I think has been seen by every president since then right. as virtually unattainable, yeah. but that doesn't stop them from <laughs> right. trying. trying. The only I'm thing trying. is they try at great length. Right. Absolutely. That's right. 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 And I think it would be fun for our um, listeners, our, our viewers, to think about other Lincoln speeches that it would be um, worthwhile for them to ponder as they're thinking about the Wills oh, wow. text. I right. think. Um, the second inaugural, which is somewhat longer, that's something like 700 words or somewhere mm -hmm. on that order, but another really great speech where Lincoln Fabulous. is trying to do different things, but also managing to encapsulate some really difficult and large ideas in a relatively short number of, of words. Mm -hmm. um, that's the one that I think comes immediately to mind. Absolutely. Um, Some people the, say it's his greatest speech. Yeah. Well, Lincoln yeah. himself apparently felt it was, yeah. um, and uh, that's pretty remarkable, I think. Um, yeah. But um, it is the one to which you want others to turn after Absolutely. they've, I mean, if you like the Gettysburg Address, address I was going to say. Be sure to read the second inaugural. <laughs> right. um, I got a speech for you. Right, right. right. <laughs> but um, it was a flabbergasting speech, actually, right. and sure. terribly, terribly moving. Right. Mm. And I, I'm hoping that our, our readers and uh, will take this as an occasion to think um, about Lincoln's career also broadly mm. um, and about the, the links you've, you mentioned, Tad, the extent to which the ideals that Lincoln thought we were fighting for were, in fact, the greatest ideals in human history, at least as far as a, a polity could achieve and attain. And I think it's important to know this is just not simply appealing to people who are interested in American history, but in thinking about the possibilities of, of human, the human yeah. existence. You know, what, what kinds of ideals can we realize in political life? And Lincoln is fighting very hard to mm. tell us what one ideal amongst that group might be. Right. Um, and right. I think that's very important. Oh, there's so many speeches uh, that are wonderful to read. Uh, I'm sure Ed would have a, a list as well. Uh, I mean, I, he, I just ran into one I had known, a, a temperance speech he gave at a very, before he was in, in politics, right? Know, in 1842. One, right. Don't know this It's one. fascinating. Yeah. And Sorry. already you can see the germ of the argument that the Declaration of the American Revolution rules out slavery. Mm. It's it's already present there. Uh, exactly. in, in in he's already thinking about it. That he's been writing the he's been writing the Gettysburg Address for a long time. I yeah. think that's mm. one thing that reading more of the speeches shows you. The Dred Scott speech right. uh, mm. that would be another fabulous one to read. Right. Um, and, uh, you know the series of speeches that he gives in his debates with with Stephen Douglas in right. 1858, which are longer, right. but which uh, are are fascinating uh, both for the ways in, in which uh, he tries to navigate the politics of a state, Illinois, which is anti-slavery or certainly anti-slave expansion, but mm -hmm. is also in many areas virul virulently anti-black mm -hmm. and virulently yeah. racist in the ways in which he tries to uh, not turn off those potential voters, but also to not give away the game that he's he's trying to play. Right. You mentioned the Cooper Union talk earlier. Which is right? a magnificent mm -hmm. speech. I, I, yeah. I, just, just between the two of us, he's a philosopher. Right? He is, he it's is. It's astounding. He thinks yeah. like like a philosopher. Absolutely. Uh, that comes which, through in the speeches in particular. high praise when we say it. Well, two <laughs> philosophers on this panel will take that. Absolutely. No, there's just something about the way that he reasons, which is, I suppose it's his legal training, but it may have been a, a cast of mind. Not all lawyers. Can uh, <laughs> reason like that. But, but think uh, of these influences that we're mentioning. It seems to me it's worth um, enumerating them. Right. I mean, the biblical biblical influence was terribly important yes, to Lincoln. Indeed. We're told he read the Bible virtually every day, yeah. mm -hmm. and it was something that he memorized large portions of. It meant a lot to him. Right. He knows this Periclean funeral oration, obviously right. extremely well, right. and so he's familiar with that. His legal training is superb, and his ability to argue a point mm -hmm. is obviously um, very, very strong. So he has a lot of different um, elements to his rhetoric, and he seems to be able in this late phase in his life to bring them together in yeah. a way that's very effective. Not, yeah. It doesn't seem artificial. No, no. not at all. You would not think that, that having so many strains would make it a, a very artificial product, but it's not. He seems to be able to, to integrate them. And that's one thing we can yeah. definitely say about the second inaugural. I think there we see the triumph of 
his process of bringing all those things together. And it's interesting to compare the reaction of Frederick Douglass, who was probably the leading public figure among African Americans of that day, uh, to the first inaugural on the one hand, where Lincoln's making a argument against secession that's also trying not to push Kentucky and Maryland, which mm -hmm. are slaveholding states that have not seceded out of the Union. And Douglas is deeply disappointed by the lack yeah. of an overt assault on slavery. Mm -hmm. In the second inaugural, we see one of the most powerful condemnations of slavery that you've ever seen mm -hmm. by a white American in history uh, that has uh, so many depths in it uh, mm -hmm. that, that uh, one simply has to read it and think about it as a document that is philosophical, that is religious, mm -hmm. uh, that is legal, that is political. And to that, Frederick Douglass had a very different uh, uh, reaction. When he heard that, he decided he was going to actually attend mm -hmm. the uh, reception after uh -huh. the inaugural, and he and Lincoln yeah. actually had a, uh, a, a very uh, friendly talk at Exchange, that point. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think we've come to the end of a really wonderful discussion, one that I think should really help our students and our, our readers find the book really intriguing. A lot of provocative observations we've made, and we'll sort of get, give them the sense that this is not simply about American history, although that's a pretty good thing to <laughs> think about. It's about big ideas that really matter to the species. Um, whatever our national origin, it's about language, it's a power of communication, um, and I think there's really a lot for people to sort of sink their teeth into, and uh, we'll invite them to go ahead and do that. Um, and as we end our discussion today, I'd also like to invite you to take a look at the Cornell University uh, Reading Project website, which will contain references to all sorts of wonderful resources. Uh, it will help you work your way through the book if you're doing that on your own and feeling a little bit lost. There will be a blog or a set of blogs that involve uh, co uh, contributions from some faculty, students, administrators, library staff, and we will hope that you might contribute to the discussion that gets generated by the blogs as well. Uh, and with that, I'll bid you adieu, and I'll thank my panelists, thank you, Tad thank Brennan, thank Hunter you. Rawlings, and Ed Baptist. Thank you. Thank you.